Hey, Heel Squad with Marie Menounos fans. Me, Mr. Maria Menounos. Your backup quarterback in. Carrying the duties, so to speak. Bringing part two of our interview with Dr. Shafali. I'm going to start with a quote. Kelsey Alexandra Meyer, if you don't mind. I would love it, Kevin. Please okay. do it. Okay, well, maybe... <laughs> <laughs> may, this bur- may this book serve as a wake-up call to all of us parents. So we realize that our children are never ours to own, nor to control, manage, produce, or create. Their presence is bestowed upon us for one reason only, to ignite our own inner prophetic and profound revolution. May we all heed this call so that we, so that we can free them to be. How about that, Dr. Oof. Phil? Cash me outside. Hmm. Uh, yeah, and this today, um, in this interview, we go far deep, deeper than in part one on parenting. Um, we discuss mm, a handful of her 20 steps to get to conscious parenting, uh, from focusing on the right problem, destroying the fantasy, relinquishing control, <laughs> ending the chase for happiness and success, dumping the savior, savior complex, and, of course, discovering your two eyes so uh yeah there's a lot there it's a lot to unfold i think super helpful and i think that dr shafali her book and her work you know whether you agree with all of it or not it's i believe on the right track to um for us to ascend as human beings but also for us um to ascend as parents in this kind of this last two decades of technology and, and insanity and consumerism and et cetera, et cetera. So, um, Kels, I don't know if you were as moved, uh, as, a as, uh, as, as someone who's still in the ute, but, uh, I certainly was very moved by this interview. It was funny. I think I, I was, but probably in obviously different ways. I more saw myself in like, honestly, the kid at the park, story i was like oh that was that was me the amount of times my poor mother had to drag me out places like me (laughs) kicking and screaming but i just think that like it's a good lesson for everybody and i mean even when she talks about uh, for me i really liked her talking about the ego and parenting but that applies to you and all your relationships so i don't know that's what i was yeah we took it back to parenting because this book is a parenting book but i'm telling you uh there's so much information to understand about yourself and your current relationships um, with people and how you, the way you were parented has, you know, and what, what you experienced in your childhood and how that has affected so many of your decisions and how hopefully as a parent, you can, you know, avoid some of them to help yours. So anyway, you'll have to let us know in the comments what you think. Um, and I guess without further ado, Kelsey, let's bring them part two of our interview with the great Dr. Shafali. You know, and I'm, we're gonna. Get, I want to get into. You have 20 steps in the new book. Um, one more valuable than the other. If I had 10 hours, I could go over every one of them with you. But we're gonna just go over just enough to, you know, help you as a parent and or as a would be parent. Um, but there is a a practice. And by the way, in the interview, I couldn't make it out. Is it called Pasna meditation? Is, vipassana. Is, it's called Vipassana meditation. How do you say, can you spell this out for me? Sure. V I P A S S A N A. V I P A S A N A. Okay. Because you spoke about that you engage in this practice. And when you talked about it, you just, it offered such hope. Because again, you and I just went really down this rabbit hole of like how crazy it's gotten. But um, through this practice, you know, these are some of the quotes that you said when you were talking about you using this practice and implementing it and how much it's helped in your own life. Um, life is every breath at a time and changing every moment. Um, it's about presence, and about being alive, and that every negative thought changes your breath, which means you're the co-creator of your reality. And um, you can choose to regulate your thoughts through breath Um, and the only way to tame your thoughts is to observe them. So can you tell me a little, can you expand more on those quotes and then on this practice? Because it feels like this is what started to set, 
this is what resets you on a daily basis because you've admitted you you like your phone too. Like you you your tendency is to reach the phone. But I think a lot of people are looking. I, there is no silver bullet. Okay, we we all know that. But people are looking for daily practices that they can start to implement to to start to migrate away from this what we've learned for the last hundred years, maybe more. Maybe so. I'll let you take it from there, Doctor Shafali. Beautiful. So in my book, it's called the Parenting Map. Um, I give 20 steps to return to healing, wholeness, and presence. And after every step, I give practice exercises because parenting, you'll see, is not just uh, an idea. It's a daily practice. Your kid comes into the world and will hit you in a way that you do not even expect. I had three masters, I had a PhD, I was a meditator, and for the life of me, no one could have prepared me for how my kid was going to hit my insecurities and absolutely blast them out uh, for exposure. I had no idea. So mindfulness practices are key in raising children. And if you don't have a mindfulness practice, you are going to be screaming bloody murder every day. Mindfulness is the key and pausing, getting to your breath, detangling your thoughts, taking a step back from your robotic reactionary patterns. This is the key to conscious parenting. And in this book, I teach parents how to detangle from your thoughts, how to disrupt your patterns, how to see your ego. You know, we parents don't even know we have an ego. So I talk about the five ego patterns of the fighter, the fixer, the feigner, the fleer, the freezer. And if you don't see these patterns in action, you're going to seriously think it's your kid, who has the problem, let's go fix the kid. And uh, therefore mindfulness teaches you to observe your thoughts, observe yourself in action. And do, do you actually take, when you say, let's say you're melting down or whatever, you step aside and you breathe, or are you, are you every morning you have your 10 minutes or your, do, do, how do you usually do it? Well, when I first started, it was a practice of sitting, you know, in the morning or at night and, and listening and listening to meditation, uh, scripts over and over again. And, and, but then over the past few years, I've become quote unquote better at it. So I don't have to sit, uh, in a confined way, but I can use it all day long. And I teach it. I have courses. I've given it for free. I have 170 free hours that I did during COVID for people because without this practice of coming back to the present, you will forever trip up on life and you will constantly be living in the future or the past, which is to live in scarcity, to live in fear and to live in the what if rather than the what is. And when you have children, nobody lives better in the isness of the present moment than children. Wow. Um, okay. There's a lot to unpack there. I don't have time, but the, the past and the present is a place most of us do live this practice brings you back to the meditation to to the to your breath but i love the idea that um we know that a negative there's there's science around uh negative thoughts changing our breath patterns which can affect our physical health and that's a big thing i'm starting to see is how much our emotions decay our physical health that western medicine seems to ignore but it, have you is do you subscribe to that belief as well that the the those negative breaths, the negative thoughts lead to a different breathing pattern, which leads to uh, a, a decay yeah. in your body, your physical body. Right. So because we have become so cut off from the present moment and our breath and our physical connection to our body, we now live in these in our headspace. Right. And now because of so much data and information, we are gone from the present moment. So we are unaware of the mind body connection. And in that unawareness, we have no clue how our mental frame, how our attitudes, our thoughts, our belief systems so impact our moment by moment physical bodies. In meditation, when you begin to observe your thoughts, you begin to observe, ah, when I had those thoughts about my, my ex or when I had those thoughts about my friend who betrayed me or uh, when I have thoughts about the future, about where my kid will go to college in 10 years, I notice my breath becomes shaky, unsteady. I breathe faster. I accelerate. My heart rate goes up. You begin to observe 
And that's the insight you begin to have that, ah, my mental framework directly impacts my experience of reality and my body. And, and But this can only come about, this awareness, through real solitude and quietude and observation. Who is observing the self anymore? Nobody. On to so, the next... It's yes. just on to the next activity, on to the next problem, yeah, yeah, or the next distraction. Yeah. Right, right. So meditation started in India, really, because in that time, in those times, whatever, 2,500 years ago, people used to go on a quest to discover what is the meaning of life? Why am I here? What, is there a better way to live? We have lost those essential questions. We are not going on a quest anymore. Everything is being handed to us. Like, like we talked about, there is no quest. It's all packaged and delivered in the in the boxes. And we're just opening boxes every day, so to speak. Every and that, day. Every day. That is the analogy of our current life. Therefore, the inner box is never being opened. There is no need to go inward anymore. But in that is a loss of a great vitality of a great inner search, which leads to inner awareness and insight and inner knowledge. We have no knowledge of ourselves. You know, we have too much knowledge of a little bit of everything, but we have no true inner knowledge. And without inner awareness, uh, you know, I remember when I was young, my father used to tell me, whatever you do in life, please introspect, please go within yourself. And, and so I came from this rich tradition that the only thing that mattered was inner connection. I was raised with that dictum. So when my when people ask me when I'm raising my daughter, I'm always saying inner connection. Please give your children the capacity to know themselves. None of that of that external quest matters if they don't have an internal quest. You know, don't take them to museums in, in fancy countries or to the top of every mountain <laughs> because that's useless if they don't have inner connection. Okay, can we now? I've hogged up all of your time with this. Can we get into your the the, the um, some of the finer points in your book? Okay, because uh, and again, I wish we had time to go through all of them, but I'll leave it for you people for people out there to buy the book. Um, it, it does center around conscious parenting, um, and and I love this quote: "Becoming conscious means understanding the core reasons why we struggle." And I yeah. think the book kind of starts to unfold from there. But let's, can you speak to that? And then I want to go over some steps with you that you give us in the book. Great. So we're talking about my book, The Parenting Map, which teaches you step by step over 20 steps, how to, the how to become a conscious parent. So I laid it out like a journey because I love the fact that we have to go on journeys in order to discover deeper truths about life. And the first stage is all about changing your mindset from the traditional paradigm of fear, control, blame, shame, and punishment to a new model called the conscious parenting model, where the parent parents themselves and through that evolution parents their children. And it's based on connection connection before correction, connection before control. The second stage is all about disrupting your childhood conditioning. If you're ruled by anger, you will be a fighter parent. If you're ruled by anxiety, you're going to be a fixer parent. If you're ruled by attention seeking, you're going to be what I call the feigner parent. If you're ruled by um, avoidance, you're going to be the freezer parent. And if you're ruled by abandonment, you're going to be the fleer parent. And it's just a uh, you know, an easy typology to kind of cast. But if yourself. you're aware of these things, that's the hope, correct? You can yes. be all these things, right? But if you're aware of it, right? I always say if you're aware, you're halfway there. But right, if so, if you're aware of these things, you can go. Oh, wait a second, this is the part of me that needs attention. That is is coming out of my parenting. This is the part of me that's angry. That's coming out of my oh, parenting. Absolutely. Right? With the minute I began to be aware that of my pattern. I see her now and I have compassion for her, but I also can talk her off the ledge, right? So seeing the pattern, like you said, is the first step. Um, Dr. Shafali, tell everyone the story that's in your book about when you took your three-year-old daughter to the park, she had a temper tantrum and because she didn't want to leave and you had to force her into the carriage and then she was screaming as if she was, you know, you were trying to murder her and everyone's staring at you and you were going home. And 
how this triggered, how informed you so much, triggered so much. Can you take it from that point? Because it was, it's a very sure. familiar story. And yes. I, I just, it really yes. set this book up in the greatest way. And the reason I chose a simple moment uh, in time between me and my three-year-old where I took her to the park and she didn't leave. Such a simple moment, right? Every parent yeah. has a moment like that. And mm -hmm. then times 1,000, right? But actually, they're all simple moments, whether the teenager is slamming the door and saying, I hate you, or calling you from college saying, oh, save me, mom, I'm at the hospital and they're pumping my stomach because I drank too much. They are actually all simple moments and they have an underlying principle, which is children F up, children develop, they haven't mastered their entire cognitive powers yet. They are in evolution, they are in formation. And the next universal pattern is because we parents don't understand who children are and how they develop, we fuck it all up. So in that example in the park, when my daughter was just being a child and did not want to leave the park, as she rightly shouldn't want to leave, because who wants yeah, to leave She's having the park? fun. Yeah. She's having so much fun. But because we parents are so arrogant and delusional that we have supreme control, I was so ill-prepared for her being a child. And I thought, well, it's time to go. Because I decided it was time. Because I needed to go home. I needed to cook. Who cared about her? So I just didn't give her notice, didn't care about her feelings. And I was like, come on, let's go. And she, you know, dared to be a human being and protested all the way back, damn it. And I couldn't believe that this little being had such an attitude because I was not prepared for the sovereignty of her soul. I was not prepared. No one told me that children are sovereign souls. I literally had some subconscious belief system that she would be a puppet. And if I put her in the bottle, time to go, time to go. So I ended up, you know, wanting to literally run away from her. And I didn't like her. And I was like, damn it, I don't like being a parent. This is no fun. Um, but then it gave me this valuable opportunity to ask myself, oh, why aren't you having fun, Shafali? Why, why do you suddenly want to, you know, leave your daughter and abandon her? Ah, it's because she's not coming under your dominion, isn't it? Because she's daring to be her own soul and she's daring to fight back for her own needs to be met. Ah, you didn't, you weren't prepared for this, were you? And it was a real come to Jesus moment for me because I was utterly humiliated. I mean, everyone was staring at me or so it felt. It's like that prototypical scene at Target, right? The kid is screaming and everyone's staring at you. You will yeah. go through, you will go through moments of humiliation. But here's the thing, we're only being humiliated because we have an ego. If we if we didn't have an ego, there would be no humiliation because we would just go, yeah, my kid is being a kid. I get it. I just need to help my kid now manage this crisis that they're having. But if I look at it like my kid is humiliating me because of my ego, now it's going to combust. So I learned in that moment that well, she What would have been the better thing? I mean, you, if you did need to get her home, was it just a matter of you get her home and you let her cry it out? Or, you know, she's yeah. free, so you can only explain a limited amount. What, what would right, the better right. response right. have the, been? The better thing was you like think? to flow with her a, I could have given her more time. I could have prepared her more to leave the park. I could have made it more fun instead of dictatorial. I became like a raging lunatic. I tried to, you know, sing to her and hum to her and make, make it cutesy, but I was seething inside. So she picked up on my anxiety. And when kids pick up on your anxiety, they literally double up on their anxiety, right? So it's a cascading influence on them. And it's a domino effect into hell. But I, I needed to pause. I needed to calm myself. I needed to luxuriate in the present moment and have fun with my kid. And had I made it fun, had I been creative, had I truly given her time and eased her into it, I can guarantee you I would have had a different outcome. But we parents are so in our rush overscheduled, overharried, you know, we command and dictate to our children. I mean, literally, we're like army sergeants from the moment they come home. That's why our children, you know, <laughs> resist us because they're like, hell, I've been, I've been bossed around all day. You're trying to be my boss. That's why kids will say, you're not the boss of me because they're so, they're so tired of being bossed around. So had I done it differently, had I approached her differently, I would have had a different outcome. 100% I would have had a different outcome. 
Um, there's a great quote in the book. To make the child the focus of parenting is faulty and toxic. If the focus were supposed to be on the child, it would be called childing. So change your focus from creating a kid to creating a new you. Yeah. Amazing. So when, when your kid is resisting you, instead of pouncing on your kid, because we've been conditioned to think, how dare the kid resist us? Instead, don't go into a fight with your kid because what you resist will persist. Instead, go into yourself and ask yourself, what, are, what, are, what am I resisting? And how can I work with this being in a way that makes us both win? I call it creating win-win situations. But the traditional parenting paradigm has set it up that it's only the parent who needs to win. And that's why we all lose. Okay, so, so devil's advocate, because um, I came from the you know, the, it's win lose. I can't, you know, I came from like, shut the F up and do what you're supposed to do. But do you think that that could be a form of placation, which is going to hurt the child later when they don't learn that life isn't always going to be win win? Right. It's not to placate, to indulge. It's to have an awareness that we are raising sovereign beings. So we want to treat them as if their voice matters, not matters more than yours, but okay. matters like yours. You know that the cause of all our problems as adulthood, uh, in adulthood, is all about not feeling seen, heard, or validated. Well, it begins in childhood. But parents mistake my approach to mean, oh, then I can just smoke pot with my kid if my kid wants it. Or I just give my kid $1,000 a week if they want it. No, it means that we both are sovereign beings and my voice matters, but so does theirs. And how do I, I as a parent, hold space and allow for both? My daughter's 20 years old now and we are win winning together. We're both winning together. Sometimes uh, she has to compromise a little bit more. Sometimes I have to compromise, but she knows that when she comes to her mom, she will be heard, she will be validated, her voice matters. And now as a young adult, I see how she self-honors herself, how she self-validates herself. And that's what you want for your young adults, right? You want them to validate themselves so they don't go down this rabbit hole of endless addiction to others yeah. and other things. Right, and so many other things, low self-esteem and just a bit bad relationships. It's funny. I remember dealing, working with someone, my goodness, 30 years ago when a, it was a fax machine was the only way to communicate. And um, he was on the road with the, his daughter. He was a single dad. And um, he would fax her homework home. Now, back then, that was a big deal. Right. And we were like, oh, my God, how fancy or whatever. And he said, hey, hey, hey. And he wasn't well off, mind you. He was middle class. And he said, hey. What makes you think her business isn't as important to her as my business is to me and yours is to you? You know, like I'm on the road here do doing my business. What? And I was like, wow, you're right. What a way of putting it. And so oh my goodness. let me tell you, if your three year old or your two year old doesn't like her socks and throws a tantrum, our tendency as a parent is to say, are you bloody kidding me? Like you're making such a big deal. I had no socks growing up. You have no idea what I went through. <laughs> right. So we dis we dismiss, we invalidate. We'll our ego. Right. But for a little kid, what is going to be important? Their matrimonial problems? Their bankruptcy? No. It's going to be socks and trinkets and rocks and shoes. You know, when my daughter used to go out on the beach or to the park, she used to come home with her little treasure collection of absolute junk, insects, rocks, sand. And she used to tell me, don't touch it. And once or twice I must have touched it because I'm arrogant thinking, well, well, this is rubbish. But then I learned, wow, to this kid in their little world, that's all they have to call their own. So let them have it. Don't desanctify what's, what's important to them because you're basing it on what's important to you. 
right? But we do that in the adult world because we don't understand the, the little worlds our children live with. All they have is their little toothpaste, their two, three candies, and their few pebbles. I mean, that's all they have. But we constantly undermine them. Or then when we take them to the park, that's their, oh my God, that's their yeah. rock concert, right? They're seeing, they, they're at a Michael Jackson or Whitney Houston concert. They're so happy to be there. But we undermine it because we're we are. Take their, yeah, we're not going to let them see the encore because we don't want to deal with traffic. Exactly. <laughs> the stadium's filled. Let's get out of here. <laughs> exactly. But when when we, when somebody does that to us, oh, we are so injured. But when our, when it's with our children, we just run roughshod over them. And then we raise children who don't feel valid, who don't feel celebrated. And then those children find validity in the wrong peer group or yeah, yeah. smoking Ooh. pot. And then we're angry with them for doing that, too. And then we're in cleanup mode and oh, the whole thing. Um, you know, and I'm, I'm skipping ahead and they shouldn't because I f feel like one of the key components, we had Dr. Gabor on, I don't know if you know him, you know, we had him on a few weeks ago and um, so much is in our um, childhood. And, and I think you have a great quote here, if I may, from the book, childhood is the ultimate game changer. Not only, uh, not only is it the blueprint for all of our later relationships, but it is the time when we learn everything about ourselves and how we are to be in the world. Quite simply, it's the most profound phase of our lives. So I think we have to explore, right? We have to, you talk about this in the book, we have to explore our own childhoods, correct? To understand who we are, so then we can be more effective as parents. Can you talk a little bit about that before we even get to messing up their lives? Let's talk about how ours were messed up. Our childhoods were messed up because we were minions to our parents' expectations and fantasies, and we could my, not. My mother would say, rightfully so. Rightfully so, <laughs> right. You dare protest. Are you oh, you had it here? so bad, didn't you? Right, right. You can't even protest. You can't even. No, no. Yes. No. So, so, by the way, you know what I do, by the way? Can I just give the side note to everybody with we, you, compassion and curiosity only for what they did? the pain and traumas they went through, how they were taught. All I say to my mom is, hey, look at me. I have a great life. You have a big hand in that. I am so grateful for everything, which is the good and the bad, because it gave me those. So I, I, I don't want to hang any of them out to dry because they only, most of them got up and tried their best and their best was that. So let, I just want to qualify with that. But that being said, let's talk about our own childhoods because that's what's affecting us as parents. Correct. And, and listen, I practice conscious parenting and I have messed up my kid and messed it up. And my kid will tell me every day that I have. So this is not about perfectionism. This is about every generation learning and in improving. And, and conscious parenting is an endless process of endless evolution. I have never reached even 24 hours of pure consciousness ever. And I don't even plan to. It's okay. It's not about some destination of some ultimate utopic, uh, you know, idea of consciousness. It's about the aspiration of evolving and growing and seeing ourselves as imperfectly flawed. You're going to go through mistakes, your mistakes, mine, you know what I mean? So yes. it's, it, of course you're going to make mistakes. Right. But let's evolve. Let's not pretend. That's what I get bothered by is this pretense that we parents are perfect. That's the problem. That's the arrogance. And that's the part your parents and my parents had, which our generation of parents where they would, wouldn't even listen. So that's not okay anymore. Now we know enough to know that guess what? We we need to listen to these beings called children and we need to treat childhood as a sacred phase of life, not as an uh, adjunct to adulthood, not as just, oh, it's a stepping stone to adulthood. No, no, Whatever. but can I qualify, Dr. Shvai, let me qualify it because I think that there's a lot of parents who do believe they're treating it as sacred, but let's define what sacred is. Is sacred every single activity, every single toy, Every single go. piece of clothing, every you know what I mean? Like in everything about the child's world. That's what I see. And the healthier parents say to me, hey, it's a, this is 50-50. They have to fit into our world too. Whereas I see a lot of parents who just stop everything. And it's we we joke that I, I joke that I'm gonna start watching more of these parents today. And when the kids grow up, the kids are like 18 or 20, I'm gonna hire them to be my executive assistants because there's no better executive assistant than these parents today, because everything is done. Every need is met for the kid. All the pain is taken away. All the pleasure is provided. So I think that they would argue that they are treating them as sacred, but what is really sacred? You know, that's yeah, but they're not, driven. They're treating their egos as sacred. Yes. That, 
that they are using their children to fulfill their own unhappiness, their own dreams. You know, making your kids dress up in color coordinated outfits is not treating them sacred. It's actually desanctifying them because you're you're puppeteering them to be the next level of you, the next version of you. That is the ego that I'm talking about. It, putting your kid in every single activity and schedule is not treating childhood as sacred. It's actually creating a mini adult who goes from one structured activity to the other. Mm -hmm. Childhood is a sacred phase when it is treated for what childhood deserves, which is long stretches of nothingness, long stretches of boredom, play, imagination, rest, not one supervised activity to the other. That is not treating childhood as the essence of childhood needs to be treated. That is actually creating supervised activities, structured entities out of childhood, competition, trophies, comparison, uh, insecurities, all that is, is a new version of childhood that is not the true version of childhood. The true version of childhood, I'm sorry to say, is kind of like how you and I had. You know, I don't want to over glorify what we had, but kind of those elements of long hours outside, lots of movement, lots of peer-to-peer -peer interaction, unsupervised by adults, lots of imagination and endless play, a lot of boredom uh, and a lack of technology, a lot of interpersonal one-on-one -on -one connection. That's so I, have, I have a my mechanic, my friend of mine is a mechanic in his backyard. I was like, what, what's with all the holes? This hole is all over his backyard. He said, when my kids say to me, I'm bored, you know what we say? Go out and dig a hole. Yeah. It's <laughs> yeah. like, bored, get out of here. You guys have everything. Go out and dig a hole. It's like kind of interesting. Right. But, right. but, that, but that is sacred childhood. We are robbing our children of sacred childhood. They're, children are not supposed to have technology in their back pocket. That is, that is, we have desanctified childhood by giving technology. Technology is not part of any real childhood. It's dirt, it's, it's soil, it's pebbles, it's stones, it's rocks, yeah. it's sky. That is the real childhood. We have lost the art of childhood now. You know, my, my father-in-law grew up in a, a village in Greece with no running water. And the only toy he ever had, it was a one marble. That was it. And he would tell me all the different things they would do to play games that were out of sticks and things like that. And, you know, but I see how he is so present and, and so alive and so young, you know, feels he's 30, 35. We asked him last night, how old do you actually feel? He's oh, 30, 35, he's 80. But yes. he acts 30, 35 in terms of, but he's very present. Very present. present. That's it. And, and our children need to be present. Children are present. You know, by, you know, when I came to this country, I had never heard of summer camp. I, I, did, I never went to a summer camp because summer in, in India was just, you know, you just sit around and just play with the kids on the street and come home and then play some more and or rest. We didn't have TV. I didn't grow up with a TV. I had one channel, you know, all my childhood maybe, which only came on at eight o'clock at night. So I had endless hours of- Dr. Shavai, do you ever, and there's something about TV you said in another interview where you watch as a family and back in the day, we would shut the TV off and say, that's it for TV. And we need to do the same with the YouTubes and stuff. So I want to offer that. I know you said that before, but do you ever resent with your children the fact that you didn't- have that stuff and do you ever bring it out on them where it's like you know i never had tv or we never had this or do you ever do that or did you do that in her yes years? yes i i do that and my daughter loves to remind me that she's not me and didn't grow up as me because that's unfair of me to say it's unfair of us to say oh you know if you grew up the way i did and look at all what you have it's not fair because it is what it is. So given it is what it is, now what do we parents do to maximize interpersonal connection, presence, stillness, quietude, simplicity? This is what childhood needs to always remain. Simple, unstructured, unsupervised play where children, you know, children's work is play. Children's work is play. That's their job is to play. Because through play with other kids, not with grown-ups and not with rules and not with the consequences if you don't follow the rules by adults. Play meaning unstructured, unsupervised play. That is children's sacred work. And we've robbed them of that because we don't understand what builds a good childhood. We've forgotten. We've lost that art. 
Okay, so we here on supervised in today's world, like this is probably I'm going to be the nervous parent. Like that scares me. Is there is there a way to do it with padded walls? Yes, you can do it in your, you know, big, big basement in your mansion. Fine, do it, you know, but, but put cameras all over, but leave them alone. Yeah. Let Why? What does that mean? It's to let them deal with their peers, even if they're four years old, as much as you can. Of course, you can hover in the background, but watch them solve problems, deal with conflicts, create resolutions, deal with each other's bullying all on their own, because that will build their inner resources to come up with their own grit and resilience. They have it in them, but we're just like, we're robbing them of their, that discovery by telling them they're gritty, but they've never experienced grit, right? No, yeah, when that's, they have not, it's the grit we've taken away from them and that's why we've lost, yeah, there's so many things that have come along with that. So with, if we go over some of the steps, I know step one, focus on the right problem. So can you talk about what that actually means? The right problem is the parent. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. So that makes sense where it's it's to look at yourself, right? Before yes. you and, and I do it with a lot of love and compassion and humor at our egos. Listen, I, I'm the first one to say how horrifically egoic I can be as a parent. And the reason I say it with so much comfort is because I want other parents to get comfortable with their egos and stop being so fragile to act like they don't have an ego. No, please, you have an ego. I can see it, just say it. And the more you say it, and when my kid calls me out on my ego, I don't even defend. I go, you're right, I'm sorry. <laughs> you're right, mom is full of ego. I don't pretend not to have one. And when your kids see you be open and accountable, they will see that it's okay to be limited and they need to be accountable too. Destroy the fantasy, step two. Destroy the fantasy that you are in control of another human's destiny, that you have to raise a perfect, supersonic, super happy child. It's all a fantasy. It's nothing to do with real life. Let it go so that then you can hop into the present moment with an embodied presence. I know that the more the parent is was crippled in their own childhood, the more elaborate the fantasy. Is that beautiful? Yes, exactly. Right? So, so if you know you're going to you're in the pre-parent phase, write down your movie for this thing, this thing called parenting. Write down your fantasies, because the more elaborate the fantasies, like you're imagining, you're going to go swimming, uh, you know, in the Turks and Caicos blue waters together with the dolphins, or we're skiing down the Alps. Any fantasies like that are going to mess your present moment because the more grand the fantasies the more you need all these external things to make it okay therefore when you're just sitting in the basement of your house hour after hour with this irritable colicky kid you're going to feel more unhappy because you're like we were supposed to be skiing right because you built out. up the fantasy right yeah. you built up the fan okay um once our baby is born the grooming begins Yes, the grooming. Oh, oh no. no. We start talking to them about the Olympics and we show them the Olympic Games. And then we're like, see, see, my kid wants to go to the Olympics. No. Yeah, because you've been talking about all this nonsense. I mean, it's right. not nonsense, but, you know, you've been filling their head with these aspirations and grooming them, right? Grooming, grooming. Oh, we are such groomers and manipulators, I'm sorry to say. But it is a fact and we just need to own that about ourselves. Relinquish control. Well, this idea that you have control, which then leads to fear mongering, which then leads to guilt and shaming, you know, this, this need to have control leads to us being out of control, you know, and it it flips us out. We, we, we become these incessant exploders or reactors or incessant fixers and enablers because we're trying to micromanage everything about this person's life. Okay. Uh, step four, and the chase for happiness and success. Yeah, this idea that we have to raise happy children is going to drive us crazy because it's going to lead our children to feel like unhappiness is anathema when actually unhappiness and discomfort is very much a part of a, of a hugely joyful life you're going to have a lot of pain and that's okay. Success, you know, again, the metrics of success being wealth, really, <laughs> and uh, having, having access to a certain social circle 
is insanity and we need to let go of these rigid metrics and embrace that there's so many avenues for success and allow our children really to know the greatest success they can have is that they actualize who they are. Okay, dump the savior complex. We, we we need to dump the savior complex because we think, we, you know, having children was a selfless act of the greatest martyrdom. And so we think that, you know, we are in charge of these children and we are here to save them. And we are kind of godlike because we, you know, enacted this selfless, great uh, act yeah, of sure. having these children. So, you know, we have this very complex idea of our role in their lives when instead we need to understand our role is really limited, but influential, but also we need to back back ourselves into our own lane. Uh, just because we've reproduced them doesn't mean we are their masters. Yeah, you say this two fundamental truths, which I love. You didn't create your kids. <laughs> they came as a biological cause and effect. That's the first truth. The second truth is um, having kids was not an act of selflessness. So your kids owe you nothing. Correct. Don't, you know, how many times it's going to come out of your mouth? Watch, you know, after all I did for you <laughs> and I gave up my career and I didn't go. I you did. Know. I already gave up everything. Gave up my youth. Right, right. <laughs> all for you, you know, and the mother especially, right? Because her body is a wreck. She could have been a prima ballerina and she's not. She's slaving over this kid who's vomiting in her hair. So, um, we have this idea that it's, uh, you know, all this selflessness and martyrdom, which then creates great guilt and uh, enmeshment with our children. Okay, this one I love. And again, whether you're a parent or not, and I think a lot of this really applies to people who are not parents. Step six, discard labels, but hear me out on this one. Judgment and labels are the, so are the scourge of our existence and the root of dysfunction in our world. Yeah, oh, right. goodness. I, 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 first of all, I engage in all of it. I am so part of the problem, but I hate myself for it. And th you're, this is it right there. That's it's, it is the scourge of our existence. Because you know? we grew up, you grew, we grew up around very rigid ideas of good and bad, beauty and ugliness, success and failure, rich and poor, fat and thin, all these judgmental categories that have led to intense self-deprecation and loathing. And we will do it to our children. We're like, that's good, that's good, good boy, and that's bad. And in our grooming, we're going to constantly push them to be what culture endorses, you know, that super mm. happy, extroverted, cheerful leader, right? And we're going to try to groom that leader so that we feel good about ourselves. And in doing that, we will undermine who our children are in their essence and categorize them conditionally and make them feel a lot of self-hatred. And they'll see us when we're doing that with other people and other things and stuff we see on the news. They're either going to, they're going to, that's going to be passed down on them as well. And so again, even if whether you're a parent or not, it's that the, the judgment and the labeling. And I, I'm trying to reverse 50 years of it. It's, you know, but I know it's terrible. Um, yeah. Labeling, another great quote, labeling our kids um, consistently, we train them to see the world from one vantage point you know, black or white, good or bad. And we know the world's gray, you know, and, and, and that's, I think that's another problem too. I call it, it's, I'm not blaming Disney for this, but I feel like people it, it's, it's you're either Luke Skywalker or Darth Vader, or your, it depends what your, your fictional go-to is you're Snow White or you're the wicked queen. You know, we, we, no one is allowed to be human and gray because no human is perfect. No, no human is, you know, may have a, you might have one face of you that's Luke Skywalker, but that's. But I feel like we're so conditioned. I don't know if it's worldwide, but certainly in this country, we're so conditioned for the black or white order evil, and it's a recipe for just disaster. Well, I, I'll take it further, so your your audience can not like me even more. But uh, oh, it, it's it's I'm right with you, so they're not going to like either of us. But. <laughs> It's not. It's not even Disney. Disney's just playing into the fundamental archetypes. Exactly. Well, they're just going right. They know where to make of, the money. Of religion, of religion, of organized religion, mm. especially 
especially monotheistic religions. I mean, yes. not to blame monotheistic religions, but when you have one God, then you have, you know, with that comes good and evil and everything else is either that or nothing. You know, at least polytheism uh, followed in many of the ancient countries and ancient cultures allows for many gods, right? So in my country, Again, not to glorify this at all, because the, the whole notion of something other and outside and higher than you is problematic. But uh, at least you can have many, you know. But having one creates that rigidity. It's good or bad, heaven and earth. It's this duality, right? That is the problem. It's rigid. It's it's antiquated. It's primitive. And it doesn't allow for nuanced complexity. And it comes from religion. I mean, talk about where good and evil really came from. Cain and Abel, the devil and the angel. Where, where did all this come from? It's fundamentally seared into our unconsciousness. And it is such a primitive, childish, immature way to look at the world. There, I said it. So it starts from there. Yeah, um, it does. Because it, it, because it fails to capture the continuum of our humanity. And, and that's really the problem. And also, if you go even further back, you know, we humans getting to the top of the food chain uh, through technology, really, and decimating the rest of the species, in effect, again, is that intolerance for diversity, right? For biodiversity, for every human to have existence, to have, to allow for every species to have validity. Uh, and, we, and then within the race, we've created white and black fundamentally, right? White and all non-white. Again, rigid duality, which is the mm -hmm. scourge of our existence. I mean, if you go to the bottom of every ism, it comes from duality. It comes from judgment. It comes from labeling in a very rigid, archaic way. Do you think, should there be something bigger than us, though, in terms of, you know, without getting in, I know everyone has different beliefs and things like that, but isn't the universe bigger than us? Is nature bigger than us? Is that? Here, here's, here's the beauty of, yes, we should tap into the reality that the universe is, is so much bigger than us. But here's the thing. Why do we tap into the reality that, the universe is so much bigger than us so that we really tap into the fact that we are infinitesimally irrelevant. And when we do that, now we come into line and our ego mm. comes in check. But do not do it that, you know, the, when you say that you, we do it the opposite way, we do it to inflame our grandiosity, not to, to limit our grandiosity. And that's our human problem. Our human error is, the, irony. is this irony. If when you truly tap into how vast and infinite the universe is, then you realize you are infinitesimally irrelevant. I say you are a, a speck on the moat of a sunbeam. That's how irrelevant you are. And when you tap into that, you have humility. You come into presence. You have gratitude for having this existence because you realize you will be wiped out quicker than a speck of dust. And now you begin to come into presence. Right. It's the grandiosity of our ego that takes us into imagery and judgment and labeling. And all of it loses the beauty of our irrelevance. <laughs> I mean, if, if visiting a cemetery is not enough or going to Europe and seeing what they did 2000 years ago. I mean, like every and I don't know, we just come and go so quickly. Yes. Even our most famous and powerful people, like, what does it matter now? I can't tell what you people die with, someone I know just died, um, hundred, you know, over a hundred million, probably maybe 200. And I, and, and so frugal and, and, and uh, didn't help people when he could have. And I just, I'm just like, you know what? what but can I say something? When you yeah. realize you are infinitesimally irrelevant, there's a profound wisdom there. Because then when your kid doesn't get the A++ or your kid doesn't, you know, go to every basketball tournament and is, you know, not winning, you're relaxing, you're okay, you're flowing. That's why near-death experiences, people who have them and come back, you know, whatever, if they've just, you know, had a terminal diagnosis, mm. but then they live, those people get into check because their ego just got punctured by the face of death and their understanding that they are really... as just as irrelevant as a speck of dust, right? That's why death diagnoses and coming near to death brings about great wisdom. Why? Because you come confrontationally close to your irrelevance, and that is a good thing for your ego. Yeah. Then when your kid gets a C grade, you're like, oh, I'm just grateful my kid reads. Yeah. But 
And yeah. grateful for a lot of other things. And that's he or she's journey or, you know, yeah. But um, what are we doing? We're, we're taking our beautiful children and making these these super fabulous, supersonic human beings when there's no need. There's no, no, need. There's no and, need. And they, all the colleges now, you know, the, the amount of money they have to spend on um, anxiety workshops, centers. Uh, and, 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 you know, it's funny, a friend of mine, big executive at a bank, and he was saying how his children are at Ivy League schools, but their the anxiety levels are so huge, and it's a very big part of the curriculum. And a lot of kids have to, you know, uh, um, get treatments at the college. And call, the facilities provide this for them. But my friend who didn't grow up with much, you know, and now has a lot, and I just said, isn't it, again, another irony that – your kids aren't going to have to worry, you know, I mean, they may not have like yachts, but they're certainly going to have a house from you. Even if it's a modest one, they're going to be able to do what a job they want that, you, you know, I mean, but yet the kids so filled with anxiety um, and being crippled by it. And I, I see so much of it. Right. Because we are chasing the wrong thing. We should be chasing irrelevance, but we're chasing relevance and relevance strokes the ego. When you chase irrelevance, it creates gratitude, humility, presence, and you just wake up. That's why every human okay. who's confronted with their irrelevance wakes up. Dr. Shafali. So I want to, I'm going to put a pin in that because I'm going to tell you a story. A friend of mine who was a, a Hollywood collector has, I think, like the slippers from the um, Wizard of Oz. It has everything. Uh -huh. And borderline hoarder. And when he was on his deathbed, he said, oh, my God, it hit me. And I was like, what, what, what? He said, it's all on loan. All of this is on loan. I don't own any of this. It just finally hit me. He's like, just on loan because I'm out. And then what? And so he had that moment. Um yeah, I know. You know, now I've got, I lost my train of thought. What a surprise. <laughs> but well, about how these labels and how we went down a rabbit hole. But yeah, so if we no, finish. But, oh, oh, help me pursue irrelevance. <laughs> I love that. I mean, come on, I work in how many, too many decades in Hollywood, right? So it's been about everything else but irrelevance. I love this. Tell me how oh, well, I pursue irrelevance. Irrelevance. Ir irrelevance is our nature. <laughs> we don't even have to pursue it. You see, here's the thing. If you're in touch with your true essence as a human being, you will see that you are a speck of dust on a moat of a sunbeam. So if, you, if you're in touch with your essence without, without feeling like that means you are worthless. See, we, we've become so um, dependent on the need for relevance and significance that we are chasing all these external validators and metrics, which are all lies. None of them bring self-worth. But we are so out of touch with our essence of our irrelevance as we are just the dust that when we are told we are dust, we, we get offended. Like, oh, I'm not dust. Not because dust. We've, lost, we've lost, we're so silly. We've lost wisdom. And what I teach is the wisdom of that. So it's the wisdom of, the, in Buddhism, it's called the empty self. The self is empty, meaning um, in and of itself, the self is just impermanence. It's just breath after breath after breath. Now we've, we've colored it up and doctored it up into fancy clothes and handbags and accessories, but that does not mean it takes away the essence of our impermanence. When you are a meditator and a wisdom seeker, you will always be in touch with your irrelevance because you are on the breath and the next breath and the next breath. And because you are with the breath, you are in touch with the meaning of life, which is life is empty of anything external. It is just of the breath. It is empty of any permanence because it is just of present moment. When you are aware of this and you're a wisdom seeker, all of the rest is so funny to you. And it's almost a, a, tra a tragic comedy that you're watching. And that's why people suffer because they've lost their connection to the essence of what life is, which is just impermanent breath and uh and we've colored it up and we think it's the a grade and the, the fancy mansion on top of the hill so our children 
are chasing that and they've lost this beauty of their of who they really are which is don't take yourself so seriously just have life experiences stop trying to you know create permanence there is no permanence so imagine if parents taught children that then children will okay they'll be like a little bothered if they if they broke their high heel but they're not going to have an eruption of a, a crisis of existential crisis because they broke their high heel or their partner dumped them for another human being it's okay you know i i've always raised my daughter saying you will be dumped and you will lose your your you know everything valuable to you but you will still be okay because you are what you and your connection to you is what matters you know she currently has somebody she's seeing in a relationship and i just keep telling her you know don't you know stick to that poor person as if they're your identity because they're not there is no such thing as permanence in anything so get used to it you know i always tell her get used to everything being there is, in there is no such thing as permanence i know and we're so arrogant that we, or just clueless that we don't consider that the very reason people say they have children is they tell me straight i want to leave a legacy and i go off what and they go off myself i go why are you the next you know are you the sliced bread like what's so great about you and and they're like i don't know like oh yeah you just think you're amazing but you're really you you of course you're amazing but you're not that amazing either that we need to hold on to you uh, in longevity and perpetuity that's that's scary ego talking right considering all this <laughs> It's deep. It's deep. Conscious parenting is a, is not just about raising children, or it's about a fundamental deconstruction of our illusions. Uh, I call my daughter Maya, which means illusion, because in order to be truly conscious and a wisdom seeker, you have to burn through the illusions, these veils, these lies that we have been indoctrinated with. And every wisdom seeker knows that they're lies, but it takes courage to burn them, to burn the veils of our illusions. And we not only don't burn the veils of our illusions, we proudly and dogmatically make our children wear them. And we're raising blind, you know, disconnected children because we are blind, we are disconnected, we are greedy, we're insecure, we're thirsty, we're insatiable, we're hungry, we, we are competitive. And we think that is the way to success, that is the way to doom. And that's why, our, look at our planet. Look at our planet. And it's thriving, has, never better. What are you talking about? Exactly. It, so it glows, isn't it? What are you talking about? What are you talking about? We're living in the golden age. So I speak from a different vantage point. Well, by the way, I don't hear many people say that we live in the golden age. I hear more people say, oh my goodness, where are we going? But the, te the, technological, the technological addicts of this world will say we are living in, a, in an age no better, right? And in some ways we are in terms some of, ways, yeah. some ways we are, but not in the ways that matter, but which is it our It comes emotion. down to us, right. Yes. And, it, and I think that this all happened too fast. So we weren't able to, you know, adapt with it. So it just came on too fast. And now we have to learn that it's about presence and about meditation, about pausing. The one thing I will say, Dr. Fali, is I was going to say, and I don't know if you noticed this in your daughter, we were in the pursuit of the mansions, I feel like. And so I, I do see in that generation, which I admire, is they're far less, at least kids I work with, far less materialistic. They're much more about life experience than materialism, which I think is a step in the right direction. Are you at least seeing that? Uh, I could say I could say great things about this next generation. They are they are more connected to the planet than we were. Yes. They are seeing our our arrogance and our ignorance of our generation, and they mm -hmm. do not like what they see. They definitely are not impressed by us, and they should not be. Uh, they are less into materialism. They are more sensitive to to the absurdity of racism, and they are yeah. great advocates of minorities. I love yeah. that about them the most. Um, but I will say that because they are a little bit thirsty for optimizing every life experience, they also in that get trapped in that mm -hmm. the life experience has to be optimal versus their attitude to the life experience, right? Yeah. So they, they, they're, they're a little bit hungry still, but they are trending, I think, in a better direction uh, than we were. Okay, I had to write that down because that's a good one too. Um, okay, so but last thing, and we'll get you guys, uh, we'll, we'll let you go on your way, but I know what discovering the two eyes, the inner child and the imposter ego. Can so stage two, 
Yeah, so stage two is like doing therapy with me in this book. If you read it, it's like how I do therapy. It's really about identifying your imposter ego. I talk about that, how our masks come about and how the imposter ego is really uh, a protector of the inner child and trying to get the inner child's needs met. So that's a beautiful section of the book where it's all about deep disruption of patterns and healing. Uh, and then part three is all about connecting with your kids. Yeah, I mean, and again, we spelled, uh, my fault, guys, I, I really went over the doom and gloom of all this, but I promise the book has the solution and the practical steps. We don't have eight hours to go over everything with you all, but I do think that the first half is awareness. So hopefully today we should gave you some light, gave me light. I know it's going to help me, Dr. Shivali, for the awareness factor. Um, I also want to say, you know, I think we also, going back to being understanding of the parent, you know, reading Dr. Gabor's book, who's, you know, he's old, he's quite a bit older, he's in his 70s. What encouraged me about reading his book was he still talked about having kind of adult temper tantrums and being petty in arguments with his wife and 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 then catching himself a day. He's like, here I am at this age and I write books and I get paid a lot of money to go and speak all over the world. And as great as I think I am and how much I do understand all this, I still make those mistakes and I still have my wife who has to check me and say, that's, you know, come on. And I realize it's my childhood traumas that are making me behave this way. So I think that, you know, reading this book is going to help, but you're still going to make those, you know, you're still going to make those mistakes. You have those moments where you're just short and you're, you're at the park and the baby's crying or the baby's on the plane and screaming. Or I had a friend <laughs> I, whose baby was so, uh, out of control at a birthday and it ruined the whole birthday party. It was a big yeah. party too. And my friend just left feeling too interested. She's like, you have no idea what it felt like because the her kid wanted the presents for herself. <laughs> she thought it was her party or I forget what it was. Right. But but you're going to have those moments and, uh, and I think that's okay too, right? Oh my goodness, of course it's okay. But we've put so much pressure again on the perfect kid, the well-behaved kid. And we put these kids in these grown-up situations of a birthday party where they're supposed to socialize and share before they are ready for those developmental tasks. So then when the kid eats all the candy or takes all the gifts, we feel like the worst parent raising a monster when actually that's just the nature of the kid to just take it. They don't see ownership. They don't know ownership, right? So we're telling them to share but they don't even know ownership. Think about how profound what I'm saying is. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I know I'm, I just complimented myself, but yeah. we, are, we are angry with our children because they don't share. But let me go even further. Kids, young kids especially, don't even understand ownership. So they don't think they need to share. They're just like, I like it, I'm keeping it. And then you keep what you like. Yeah. And then if they have a fight about it, it's not because they're monsters in the making. It's because they don't even understand ownership. They're like, what's the big deal? Why can't I take all the gifts home? Did so. In those moments, you try to teach them, or is it still too early for them to comprehend? And you just—I mean, you can, of course, you try, but you don't have to lose your mind thinking that you're a failure because they're developmentally not yet ready. They will learn. They do learn. We're so anxious again because we feel the pressure to raise these perfect mini adults that we're actually over before they are ready to even get to that developmental task. So they're getting punished, they're getting blamed, they're getting yelled at, but we don't see how we've taken them out of their element to behave in situations they're not equipped to behave in. But there is a time and place that they need to learn those lessons. It's just not before the age of four. We're trying to do everything before the age of four, which is insane. We're trying to raise these altruistic Mother Teresa, super competent linguist, linguists before the age of four when they're not ready. They're not yet ready. So there's a time and place, uh, but people need to understand that. And I teach that in my book, but I do have to run to my next interview. You, so sorry. You, we, you have done above mm -hmm. and beyond Dr. Shafali, and this was uh, incredibly educational and entertaining as well. And um, I'm just really grateful. And once again, um, the book, which is going to be out February 28th, Parenting Map, it's out, but also you have your website too, Dr. Shivali, right? That has all of your information in your other books. What's the website? Yes, it's just dr for Dr. Shifali.com. I have so many courses. I have free meditations. I have relationship courses, parenting courses, anger courses. Um, 
of courses for the empowerment of women. I have a coaching institute as well. So people want to become coaches in what I teach. They can join my institute. But uh, it's been a pleasure. You're such a sincere, curious wisdom seeker. And I really am honored to have been part of your podcast. And I wish you all the best uh, because you're going to need all the wishings and blessings. Yeah. Um, and I know you're going to come see me. And yes, I, I'm, I'm, gonna be, I'm sorry to say, I'm going to find my way into your world somehow because um, I'm so excited. Yes. You're yeah. the best. Thank you, doctor. And I look forward to staying in touch and becoming better friends. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you. Okay, and that wraps our interview with Dr. Shafali uh, about parenting. I know that um, I am not worthy of being a parent. Self. I was going to say, how are you feeling? <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm no blessed because the information in that book was incredibly, uh, this interview was incredibly helpful. The book is a great, um, it's going to be a great reference to use along the way. And um, I think the I think really giving up the idea that you're going to be perfect at it because you're not going to be, and that they're going to be perfect as children, because they're not going to be. Um, yeah. But I act, but I really think, Kelsey, that the way the world is going, the way technology has just come on too hard and too fast, what it's done to our youth in the last 20 years, I feel like this book and, you know, conscious parenting and looking at um, parenting in a new way is, is, it's not a luxury, it's a necessity. Mm. And, um, and whether, you know, you agree with everything in the book, there's just, enough in there I think to make you think twice about how we've been doing things and I think there is better ways to do it so um, yeah I'm I'm really grateful to this interview and I'm grateful to her as an author and um, yeah you'll have to let us know in the comments if you agree or disagree and you know I have to say quickly Kev before we wrap Please. out one thing that I really loved was kind of I think we all know this but her saying it I don't know really hit home for me when she was talking about the tantrum of her daughter at the park which I know I did to my mom so many times but seeing your kid as an individual like human versus kind of just that puppet mm -hmm. that to me I was like oh my gosh yeah and her just giving examples of how easy it would have been to to prep her a little bit prior to be like hey we're we're gonna go and mm -hmm. what she was saying was not like you know let the kid run the ride and be the person the one in charge but like honoring them as the individual they are i just i don't know to me that was really i was like oh that makes sense i mean i so. think you you we all kind of go to the default which is like hey you're a kid i'm mm -hmm. the boss listen but when you think about the fact of all the repercussions that could come out of that later and the disservice you're doing to the child you realize like hmm there's a there's a common ground. There's definitely not spoiling or allowing them to do whatever they want, but there's something to be said for hey, you know, your you matter, your feelings matter, your perspective matters. Yeah, yeah it's a lot. It's a lot. I'm really excited to 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 refer to the book as a, as if I hopefully I get a chance to be a parent. But um, yeah, it certainly encourages to other people as well. So with that, Kelsey, what do we do? We be nice people. We, we be nice people. We make good choices and we be present. Yeah, that's it. This podcast and all related content published or distributed by or on behalf of Maria Menunos or mariamenunos.com is for informational purposes only and may include information that is general in nature and that is not specific to you. Any information or opinions expressed or contained herein are not intended to serve as or replace medical advice, nor to diagnose, prescribe, or treat any disease, condition, illness, or injury, and you should consult the healthcare professional of your choice regarding all matters concerning your health, including before beginning any exercise, weight loss, or healthcare program. If you have or suspect you may have a healthcare emergency, please contact a qualified healthcare professional for treatment. Any information or opinions provided by a guest expert or host featured within website or on company's podcast are their own, not those of Maria Menounos or the company. Accordingly, Maria Menounos and the company cannot be responsible for any results or consequences or actions you may take based on information or opinions.